Okay, so today we want to talk about some basic introduction. We will talk about uh, what will be in that course, what you want to learn from that course. I will ask you about your interests related to that course or maybe unrelated to that course, but somehow related. And to contact me, basically, you know, all of you should know how to contact me. It's very easy. I prefer email or contacting information and everything. If you want to meet me, you can meet me before the lecture, after the lecture, or by email appointment, or you find me in the office, which is more difficult probably than to find me by email, but you can try. Uh, my office is here, 261D. Uh, my email is given here, and you have also that email on the website, on Canvas. Everything will be published on Canvas, including lectures, including all of the information you need to know, announcements, additional materials, uh, homeworks, uh, grades, everything will be published on Canvas. Already I published, I believe, two first parts, two first weeks, and uh, those two first weeks are lectures and homeworks. Now, um, my phone is given here. Again, it's much easier to find me by email and not by phone, but anyway, you can try. Now, why we want to learn in general that kind of course of modern control? All of you, or maybe most of you, already took some course on control systems, right? You had some introduction to classical control, and now we are talking about modern control, which is more linear algebra, more automatic uh, controls, and more programming, and more sophisticated math, if you like, more advanced math. So why we need all of that? In my opinion, you have two answers to that kind of question. First one is that this is very practically applicable to many different problems. And it's not only program, problems with robotics or problems with actual robotic arms and stuff like that. It's also used in chemical processes, it's used in space, it's used in military, it's used in multiple different applications. Now, Modern control is still in wide use in those applications in industry, manufacturing, even in prediction of stock market, if you like. So those are, this sounds as unrelated things, but those things are related. And they are coming together in that kind of course, where you have part of estimation, which is trying to guess or to predict something, and also trying to control something, where you have some sort of process which could be mechanical process, chemical process, biological process, any other process that you would like to control somehow by designing some sort of circuitry or designing some sort of mechanism which will control whatever you want to control. But the most important thing here is basically not this one. This is what I think the most important thing that you need to take from that course. Because, again, you have already some control background, but this is not... The, the important thing is not to learn specifically control. The important thing is to learn from that course specific mindset and to use it for solving different problems. As engineers, you're obviously solving all kinds of problems in all kinds of domains. Now, we are used as engineers and trained engineers to solve problems starting from micro level. Micro kind of dividing system into tiny, tiny parts and then learning how to connect them together. So you're starting to learn how transistor works, how to add a few resistors to that transistor, how to add second transistor, how to add third transistor, and then you're getting to more and more sophisticated things from bottom up. Basically, this is what engineer most engineers at least learn that way. And then when you get to one million transistors, um, it's very difficult really to understand what it actually does. Right, well, what the circuit does with million transistors and how to handle that, how to think about the circuit, what to do with that. Right, so you know one transistor, two transistors, and you have experience with three. Now you have one million, now what? Okay, this is a big problem for most engineers that just start to work on different big projects. Now, control systems are going other way around. They're going from here to there. They're starting with the system. And they say, well, there's some sort of black box. I don't know what inside of that black box. And maybe it's not correct to say, but I don't care. 
what is inside of that black box. Something, some system, whatever it is. Now, having that system, I have also some inputs and some outputs to that system. Now, question number one, I want to analyze what is inside of that black box. I want to say, I want to describe the system somehow, in multiple different ways. How I do that? I'm sending all kinds of inputs and measuring all kinds of outputs. Basically, I'm getting from inputs some outputs, responses of the system. From those responses, I can learn what is inside of that black box. Without details, I will not tell you how many transistors are there. I will not tell you what exactly the system inside is. But I will tell you that in abstract sense. That abstract sense will basically tell me how the system will behave if I will put some other inputs in that system. And I will be able to predict how the system will behave with other, system, with other inputs that I never saw before. And this is very important viewpoint on any system in general, abstract viewpoint. And this is what you, I want you to learn from that course, that abstract mathematical viewpoint where you don't really know what is inside, but you want to say how it will behave without knowing details of what is going on inside. Now, another question that we are asking, how to control that system, which is, yeah, I don't know what that system is. It's still black box. I can analyze it. I can predict approximately what it will do. Based on my prediction, can I control it? Can I say, like, what kind of circuit I need to add to that or system I need to add to that, that this system will behave as I want? In other words, the outputs will be something that I want. Now, this is difficult to do because modeling is difficult. And we will see a few ways to model systems and how we go about modeling systems and how we then control those systems based on the model. Models are not precise. You have all kinds of uncertainties, you have disturbances, you have noise, you have multiple different problems with those models. But they are better than nothing, okay? And in general, in engineering, it's better for you to know that in most cases, you're just satisfied with whatever you have and not with what you want. You never get what you want. You get only what you can get, okay? By mathematical modeling, by prediction, by multiple different ways. Now, this is the most important part that you need to take from that course. And this is not specific to controls. This is everywhere. This could be applied to anything. This is just specific mindset where you're saying, well, something is inside, you have inputs, outputs, how I manage that thing somehow. Kind of magic. Okay, one more thing. This course will be probably extremely mathematical. So I will not get too much into physics of the things. We will see something in that lecture, how to model motor, basic stuff but I will not really go to physics. So we'll start with math. But you need to understand that behind the scenes you have physics. And physics always wins. What I mean by that is that if your mathematical kind of result, you computed everything correctly, you tested that in MATLAB, you ran the program or Simulink or whatever, it shows you some result which makes no sense physically, the result is wrong no matter what you did. This might be your mistake in the computations. This might be everything correct, but math is showing something wrong. Physics is always right. So if you get input to some amplifier, which is one million volts, forget that this is wrong. Okay, this is not possible. Even if mathematically it's correct. And you need to be aware of that all the time when you're working with those systems to understand that you have always uncertainty in models. And this is the most important thing that you need to remember. Mathematically, you cancel all kinds of poles, zeros, stuff like that. Practically, they are not canceling. Practically, the system is not even linear. So you need to remember what happens to real system when we're doing that, okay? So we will go through a few of those points right now from the classical control. And I'm almost sure that nobody mentions those points in classical control when teaching the course because it's difficult anyway, even without those more complicated points, which are related to physics and reality, if you like. So those courses are generally more theoretical, um, but we will try to understand the physics behind it. 
Like, why is this will not work? It looks like working, mathematically looks great, but if you actually plug in that to the system, it fails. Why is that? So it's important to understand all of those tiny, simple things. Simple example, you have a motor, DC motor. You put in some battery to that motor, this motor starts to rotate, right? You put in higher voltage, it starts to rotate faster, right? Everybody would accept something like that. This is a simple thing. You put in some voltage to the motor, like constant DC voltage, battery, it starts to rotate. Stronger the battery is, faster that thing rotates. Let's say you put in 0.1 volt battery to that motor. What will happen to the motor? It will rotate slowly. It won't rotate. It will not rotate at all because you have static friction. Are you using the static friction anywhere in the computations? No, you're just ignoring it. Which means you're already, already assuming that your voltage will be higher than some threshold, right? Higher than something. Otherwise, let's say your controller gives you voltages which are 0 0.1, minus 0 0.1, nothing happens. It's supposed to sort of rotate, but it's not. And it will not rotate. So you need to remember about the physics behind the scenes, behind that mess. So mathematically, everything will be nice and simple in metal. Practically, it's not that simple, unfortunately, and you need still to remember those things. And this is the biggest mistake that most students are doing when they're taking that course. They're forgetting about physics. They're just saying, well, I will manipulate those matrices, multiply, divide, and stuff like that, and this is what I get. This is a number. No, this will not work that way. So controls is all about physics, not about math. So we're using only math, almost exclusively. We will not even talk about physical systems. We will give you matrices. Okay, you'll get matrices, 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 differential equations, and matrices again. This is the course. So it's modern control theory. But this theory helps you to get in depth and to understand multiple different things, to understand better robotics research, to understand better prediction, evaluation of systems, analysis of all kinds of things, multiple different things. Again, you don't have to understand all of the details of the thing. I can give you all of the basics that you need probably in three hours. This is all of the material, but this is based on your knowledge of math, advanced math, differential equations, and so on, and linear algebra, vector spaces, and so on and so on. So if you know all of that, I can teach the entire course in three hours. But most people or don't remember it or don't know it or never took any linear algebra. Uh, mm -hmm. before, and this makes it a little bit difficult to get to the material of that course. And I will tell you why. It's not that you cannot learn linear algebra along the way. You can. But linear algebra is such abstract thinking process that you need to get used to. This is what's the problem. Yeah. If you are not used to it, and you need to to think about that like half a year, about linear algebra before you get used to the met methods and techniques of linear algebra before you take the course essentially. So hopefully we'll go slowly, so my plan at least, to go not too fast. We have plenty of time. We can go slowly. If you have any kind of questions or any kind of problems, or you don't remember something from algebra, differential equations, uh, whatever math, just stop me, okay? And this is second biggest mistake that most students do. They're not stopping me. They're saying, well, I will understand that later, I will read. No, we have tons of time. It doesn't matter if you will not get to the last topic of the last session. It's graduate course. You have all time you want. Okay, you can sit on linear algebra half of the semester if you want. It doesn't matter. Okay, it's more important that you will learn something important. Okay, something new for you. And something that you'll be able to apply. Even if you learn only linear algebra from the entire course, just forget the controls. Linear algebra, okay, it's already useful. Whether you go to signal processing or controls or machine learning or whatever area you choose, linear algebra is super important. Okay, so just if you don't get something, just stop me right there. Don't wait until I will understand that you don't get it. And we are a small class, so we can basically talk, we can discuss different things, we can 
try to understand it in depth if something is not clear. Something I might skip. I mean, obviously, I will not give you all of the proofs of all of those theorems or control. Maybe some of that just explanation more than proof, not really proofs, more intuitive ideas behind some of the proofs or behind some of the ideas that we have in the course. But mostly, it will be just explanation, not real mathematical proof with all of the details. OK? Now, we can talk about uh, the syllabus right now. So again, I mentioned already all kinds of things like my email, my phone, my office, office hours, anytime you can find me, mainly on email. Um, I recommend to add EE641 to the email because sometimes uh, output just blocks emails if they come in too frequently or like, mistaken for spam. So it's better to add that thing. Now, we will not have any textbook. You don't need to buy anything. I will have handouts on Canvas, so you can download, print if you want. You can leave it there. You can read online. Now, um, you have tons of textbooks on modern control. Dozens and dozens of different textbooks. I left some description of some of them, which are kind of relevant to our course online in Canvas. So you have textbook review. It's very brief. It just says that material included in that section, that material included in, in that book. Um, if you want, you can buy it just for deeper understanding of the topic, if you want the topic. Now, I don't know what is your goals and what you intend to take from that course, because I obviously know some of you working on something related, but not exactly. Right? Things which are, if you're working on robotics, yeah, you have linear algebra, you have controls, obviously, you have manipulators and you have other things. But if you are interested more in other parts of robotics, which are more brain of the robot and artificial intelligence and doing all kinds of additional things, obviously, modern control is not your first priority. If you want to work on signal processing, yeah, you have in signal processing all kinds of adaptive mechanisms that were taken historically from controls. For, the, for example, adaptive signal processing, which is used in every form now, now like reducing noise and stuff like that, determining the environment, noise automatically, and then reduces noise based on that algorithm like LMS, RLS, and so on. Interestingly, first people invented controls which are related to those algorithms. So those algorithms were invented for adaptive control. And only then people disconnected the feedback and used that for signal processing or analysis. So they basically throw out the, the feedback part from adaptive controls and they've got adaptive signal processing algorithms. The same algorithm, exactly the same, just no feedback loop. Now, adaptive control basically, unfortunately, died officially died probably in the 80s. And the reason was that people afraid to use it. It's great theory. It works great. People use that, but they're afraid to use it because you don't know the model. You don't know constant position of all kinds of coefficients in the model. And then you're trying to control it. Would you put that on airplane, for example? It works great. And mathematically proven that it always will be stable. Okay, you can prove it mathematically. The system is perfect, great, stabilizes in no time, much better than any PID controllers, PD controllers that you learned, lead leg controllers that you learned, you name it. It works better than any other controller ever. Nobody uses that. For one reason, people are afraid of using it. And most of the systems which are working in controls are very expensive, so they're afraid to destroy it by somehow incorrectly tuned control, okay? And since you're not controlling really how it will be tuned, it, it is based on the signals that are coming in, you cannot predict how it will behave. And this is fearful. So people don't use it. And this is why this basically area died some years ago. Now, 
Uh, you have some dates here for last class, last date to withdraw from the class. Um, prerequisites, this is what's important. Now, I don't know what prerequisites you really have. I assume that you know some linear algebra. Um, again, I have no idea. You tell me what you really know, and this will be very useful for me, how fast I need to go and what I need basically to emphasize because you'll be using all of, it, all of the linear algebra including some advanced stuff from linear algebra. So before we get there, we need to learn it probably. Now, uh, I don't know even what we are teaching here as linear algebra. I've heard about basic things like matrices, vectors, multiplying, adding, stuff like that. Uh, how about eigenvectors, eigenvalues? Uh, what do you mean by minimum? Sublecture in PD300 that we solved for eigenvalues, but it was in like a three by three matrix. And it was all real numbers and positive and yeah, very simple. Okay, so you saw some example. Yeah. Okay, how about, okay, how about positive definite matrices? I've heard the term, couldn't tell you what oh. it is exactly. Okay, how about, uh, Span. Span is spans like uh, the, the space that's defined by the basic vectors. So yes. So some vectors which are spanning some subspace. So no vector spaces, nothing like that. I've, I've learned some extra stuff from online, but the, the linear algebra we have. So I'm talking about like what you had in your course background. Yeah, very minimal. Very minimal. How about square root of matrix? So let's get the composition. Well, if you would decomposition, or let's get the composition, you have all kinds. Yeah. yeah. How about this? We, um, we did, we did uh, SVD in uh, machine learning. Yes. Yes. So, uh, what else we have there? Uh, determinants. Yeah. To compute any order of determinants or just basic examples. So this is different course. Oh, you've been looking for control systems. So, uh, so what else we have in algebra? We have uh, Kelly Hamilton theorem. I've heard of it. Okay, that's nice. <laughs> we all start from basics. That's fine. That's fine. Okay, so what else? Uh, you assume to know some control systems, obviously, because I don't want to get all of the course of control systems again. Uh, you will not need much of that. Today, we will basically pass through all of the control systems you need to know for that specific course. Laplace transforms, uh, since we will be using as domain, obviously you need to know something about the plus transforms. This is not like in uh, regular signals and systems course where you need to use tables and stuff like that. Uh, nothing really of that kind. Everything you need basically is how derivative looks like and how integral looks like. 
which is multiplication by s and division by s. That's it. This is all you need to know from more constants. Um, some calculus. So to understand differential equations, obviously you need to understand calculus. So without calculus, you cannot understand how to solve differential equations. And you need to know some basics of differential equations. Uh, I will give you the formulas to solve it, but it would be nice if you have already the background. And this is not the first time you actually see it. This would be much more convenient for you if you doing that not the first time. Now, we will have some project, which will take 30% of the grade. It will be probably will publish that in a week or two. Um, so this is 30% of the grade. 70% of the grade will be homeworks. And you will have, I believe, uh, nine. Nine homeworks. And you need to submit seven of them. I mean, I will take just seven best out of uh, nine. So you can So you will need to do, you can do all nine of them and then it will be just seven best out of nine homeworks, but you have to submit at least seven to get full grade. Now, the topics of the course will cover the following. You have first of all introduction to discrete and continuous time state space systems. Have you heard about state space before? All of you heard about state space? Okay. To which extent you heard about state space? <laughs> it's just somebody mentioned that there is state space or... Okay. So you solved already some systems with state space and feed the controllers, I assume, state controllers? No? Or just... Or, or just like convert it. So you saw block diagrams of state space. Okay. Now we'll talk also about canonical forms. Canonical forms are basically easy ways to transfer from transfer function into state space automatically without thinking too much. This is very convenient. And you will see at the end of maybe this lecture how difficult that thing is without those canonical forms. So generally I like to introduce topic from a little bit different perspective, which means that I'm showing you the straightforward way to solve a problem, whatever the problem is, and then next time I'm showing how to solve the problem easily. This shows you that people really thought hard to get to that solution. It's not, it was not obvious that you get that kind of simple solution to your problem. But some problems are solved easily and technically. Then we will talk about uh, pole placement, this state feedback which means this is automatic design of controller using some code, it's basically single line in MATLAB. We shall design controller for you to place poles anywhere you want. So if you remember from design in control systems course, it was kind of black magic. So you need to play with the numbers, to tune it, to get it through root locals, or to get it through body diagrams, or you know, all of that stuff. And then you're playing with uh, graphs until you get shape you want. Something of that kind, right? Until you get result which kind of works, but not exactly. So you, you don't get exactly, you, you never get exactly the overshoot you want, the setting time you want, and so on, right? So you get approximately plus minus with some tolerance. And then you need to play more to get something closer to what you want. Now, modern control is completely different in that sense. In modern control, you're saying where you want it to be, it will be there, precisely, with one line of network. So everything is designed with a single line of network. Okay, and even computation by hand, not that, not that difficult. Okay, based on eigenvalues, but still not difficult. Okay, just computation of eigenvalues of the system, nothing else. Just positioning those eigenvalues of wherever you want. Now, later we will talk a little bit about uh, state estimator which is observer, and this is important to learn because observers are used not only in controls. Observers are used to predict different kinds of signals in all kinds of systems. Very broad concept where you want to predict what will happen 
to specific state. And observers are generally, it's interesting history that observers actually were developed after optimal observers. So first optimal observer was developed and then regular observer, which is make no sense at all. But historically, this is how it happened. And we will later learn about Kalman filters, which are optimal observers. Okay, so it's number eight. Before that, we will learn about non-minimal canonical forms. So those are systems with cancellation of zeros and poles. Those are non-minimal systems, and we want to write for them some sort of representation. We'll talk about linearization of the systems because obviously all physical systems are non-linear. It's difficult to imagine some system which is completely linear. All of them are non-linear, so we need to do some linearization and then we can control them somehow. Then we will talk about Leponov stability. This is a separate kind of stability. You already probably heard and learned about Bibo stability, which is bounded input, bounded output. So you enter in some sort of input and you get some bounded output if the input is bounded for the Bibo system, Bibo stable system. Now, you learned also about asymptotic stability. But asymptotic stability is defined for initial conditions of the system. So you have zero input, zero input response, you're starting the system from some specific initial conditions, like angle of the motor or whatever, or initial voltage, and then it starts to decay to zero or to diverge. So if the system is asymptotically stable, the system is basically converging to zero after infinite time from initial conditions, with zero input. And this one is Leponov stability, which is a little bit different from both of those stabilities. And you have many more types of stability which we will not touch, but this is important for state space especially. Now we will move to linear quadratic regulator, and this probably is the most popular controller of all times. Because it is, first of all, works great, very simple tuning, you don't need to do much tuning at all. You're defining how much voltage you want to invest or how much signal input signal you want to invest, and you want to minimize the output to stabilize the system. And system is promised to be stable with that kind of controller. So this controller stabilizes the system, first of all, even if the system is unstable, and puts your poles wherever you want them to be, okay? And puts effort on the system to be minimal automatically. All of that at the same time. So perfect for all kinds of applications. And those controllers are actually used in practice a lot because easy to tune, easy to put in, easy to control, okay? And promise to be stable forever, no matter what. So very good controllers. Now we will learn about Kalman filter, which is optimal estimator. And then we will move to linear quadratic Gaussian control, which is basically optimal estimator is optimal controller. Put it together. They basically, again, two lines of metal cold down, giving you controller which is sitting in the system like a classical controller, which means it's serial controller in the system now, not state space controller. So creating basically actual transfer function, computing transfer function, which will put system in the state you want automatically with two lines of code. And if you'll have time left, which I'm not sure about, so this part is optional, we can talk about more modern theory of control, which is robust control. Uh, robust control was basically topic of my master's degree. Thesis, and uh, I did something in that domain. It is still under development. I mean, people developed that mostly from 80s to 2000, and still some development is going on until now but it's kind of decaying now. So you have more advanced stuff for nonlinear systems, you have more advanced stuff for adaptive systems, you have more adaptive uh, and learning stuff, like learning controllers uh, with machine learning, which is very popular right now, and fuzzy logic controllers and other more modern topics which are more computationally expensive than all of those. Now, um, before we move on, I just want to mention a few policies that we have in the course. So you expected to use MATLAB for your project, and I want you to use MATLAB also for checking all of your homework exercises, the answers at least. 
but you cannot use MATLAB for solving them. So you cannot say like MATLAB did it, something like that. So it's like answering MATLAB did it. You need, if you have kind of problems that you need to solve by hand, all of the problems should be solved by hand, okay? For MATLAB, you have special project, which will be done in Simulink, okay? So you need to install MATLAB if you don't have it yet. Cheating and plagiarism policy, well, for graduate students, it should be kind of obvious that cheating is bad, right? All students know it, still many students cheat, if not all. I also was a student and for tests, sometimes wrote all kind of tiny notes for myself. Uh, kind of cheating, not too horrible, but now I understand why it is bad and most people don't. I don't know why, but most people don't understand that basically they hurt others when they cheat and themselves when they cheat. Now, again, in that course, it's not that important. Why? Because you will get A anyway. I mean, if you submit all of the homeworks and you submit uh, the project, you get A. You don't have to cheat. Like, why would you? You learn for yourself. You, you, do, like, you will do yourself this service if you copy from somebody else. Because you will not learn the topic, right? And nobody will gain from that anyway. So, just remember that cheating is bad and don't do it. Um, accessibility statement, uh, this is a standard statement that you obviously have in all the courses at UEB. If you have any specific problems or any special needs or any requests that might prevent you from taking the course in normal way okay, or in a convenient way, you can talk to me, you can talk to those services, DSS services, and we will try to solve, resolve all of those problems if you have any troubles with that. Title nine statement, also standard one. We all adults here, hopefully nothing bad will happen to any of us, but obviously all of the harassment and other stuff like that is strictly prohibited if you notice something in this class or outside of that class, anywhere, you need to report it. Okay? Any questions? Okay, so just brief history of controls. Controls have very long history, starting in BC era, where all kinds of water clocks were invented, different kinds, and they were obviously mechanical controlled mechanisms, not electrical, but there's also control mechanisms. Now, later in 1600 plus, first thermostat was invented. It's a huge jump in number of years from BC part. Not too much in between, actually. You have some sort of controls, some sort of mechanical mechanisms which are controlling water supply, but not even temperature before 1600. Okay, and this was kind of first oven which was automatic for incubation of eggs. It was invented in 1620s. Now, you probably heard about James Watt for a completely different thing. This is why we have power units called Watt, right, in electrical engineering. This is the same James Watt. And he invented basically centrifugal governor, which is controller. The idea is kind of simple, but nobody thought about that idea before. And this was used later for trains. So in train, when you have kind of uh, boiling water, right? And you need to control the amount of boiling water and the temperature in the big thing. You need to open steam to some specific rate, which means you need to open it more when you need to slow down. And you need to close it more when you want to go faster, right? So how can you do that? You can do that with that kind of device, which is here, let's say you can draw on the screen. So I'm talking about that device. No, open the screen. Okay. 
Okay. So that thing. Have you seen that thing anywhere? I actually took that photo by myself. You need to visit Tannehill. This is in Tannehill Museum. Like Iron Works. It's 20 minutes from Birmingham. I think it's the best from Birmingham. Tannehill Museum. So there you have all kinds of machinery with those devices. And it looks like you have some metallic balls here. And then you have that system. And you have all that thing moving apart or moving close to each other. Depends on the rotation speed. So when centrifugal force working that way, right? When this thing is rotating, those things are coming higher and higher. And when they're coming higher and higher, they basically push some sort of road down. And this road here is pushing some mechanism which is opening some sort of hole. Okay? So when the speed becomes too fast, right? So it's too high, it pushed too much, this one is fully open. When it starts to rotate slowly, it goes and closes that thing, right? So Just by its centrifugal force. Yes. Attached to the wheel. So it's actually capable of controlling the uh, velocity of that thing. So interestingly, you don't see annotation on the screen. Let's see if I can use different kind of annotation. Okay, so this one works. Okay, so basically controlling that thing. And this one closes or opens the hole for steam. And then this is how steam engine works. The centrifugal government. And James Watt was the inventor of that kind of process that you can control something with simple mechanical motion and to open and close different uh, mechanisms. Now, James Maxwell, you probably also heard that name, right? Let me open the door, please. And you have heard that name, obviously, from Maxwell equations. So this is the same person. And he invented, it's, it's not invented, he developed theory to explain why those things sometimes go unstable. So he mathematically were able to explain why those things sometimes get unstable. They just break. You cannot control it well. So he explained using mathematical theory what kind of systems will be stable and what kind of systems will be unstable. Now, what you learned in control systems course was something similar, which is Ralph Hurwitz criterion and Nyquist criterion for stability, right? Do you remember any of those? So those were based on his idea. So he, he provided very limited idea for third order equations or for differential equations of specific type, but they developed that for any type of equations, any type of transfer functions. But he was the first one to start it and it was in 1868. Now, later, people divided that into multiple different eras of controls. So they started with classical control, which essentially 35 to 50, you can say from 1900 to 50, the first half of the 20th century was classical control. Now, the name of our course is modern control, and this is basically a little bit misleading because when we're talking about modern, we're thinking like it's now, right, modern but it was modern in the 60s. And they called it modern to differentiate it from classical control. 
Essentially, it's not modern for us. Modern is 60s, 80s. So from 60 to 80, this is kind of optimal control or modern control. You can say that optimal control also was developed in 50s, um, and then robust control from 80s to nowadays. Again, as I said, it's already became. And many people were involved in that. For example, Leminorsky was uh, develop, developed a uh, very known controller, which is PID controller. And it was used already in 20s, I believe, on some battleships to navigate for navigation purposes. A PID controller was used back there. Um, Harold Black, have you heard that name? So he was American engineer, electrical engineer, and he invented negative feedback. So if you know operational amplifiers, is negative feedback of transistor amplifiers, is negative feedback. He is the first person, he is the first person to develop that, to develop theory behind those, that, that kind of circuitry, is negative feedback. And he proved that they could be stabilized with negative feedback and you can reduce noise with negative feedback and you can get disturbance control under, under control and other nice things that we know now about feedbacks. Hendrik Bode invented his diagram, not for controls, not really. He worked with amplifiers and he wrote a book or even textbook in 45 on amplifiers and design of amplifiers. And his diagrams were used for designing of amplifiers. So it's interesting that what we call now body diagrams has nothing to do with his diagrams. Um, his diagrams were basically for one divided by transfer functions that we are using today. So he used something which is called admittance instead of impedance. So he worked with actual electrical quantities and he used like one over Z and not Z in all of his transfer, transfer functions. He called the transfer function Hubert. This is not the same transfer function as we would call it today. Okay, so you need to make a difference. Walter Evans uh, developed root locus. Nyquist developed many different things, including Nyquist criteria for stability, you know, Nyquist also for uh, sampling, frequency, and for his name, Nyquist frequency in signal analysis. Um, now, Ragazzini was uh, developing digital controls with his students. Jakob Sipkin also was developing digital controls. And now, modern control was developed by many different people. Um, Kalman developed Kalman filter, obviously, which is optimal estimator. Wiener, Norbert Wiener, do you know that name? So he basically was the father. Hmm? You have Wiener filter, yes. You have Wiener filter, but this is not what he is known for. He was basically the father of cybernetics, which was basically origin of many control theories, machine learning, and other neural networks. So this was basically the basis of neural networks. He tried to understand how the brain works from biological and mathematical standpoint. So he was one of the first people to develop together feedbacks and neural networks from the brain. So at that time, it was not known Nothing, nothing was known about neural networks, it was like uh, 40s. Um, so Pitts just developed his first uh, perceptron at that time, and nobody knew how to use it anyway. And this professor from, I believe, Princeton, he developed most of the theory behind it. Okay, how to use artificial intelligence using neural networks, and how to use feedbacks in those networks, and, a lot of different other things, including Wiener filter, which is basically Kalman filter is Wiener filter, which is realizable in physics. It's possible to build physically. Wiener filter is more theoretical. It's, uh, you can build it, but you need to approximate it. It's not precise when you are approximating. Now, David Leuenberger developed Observer which again was after Kalman developed his observer, but he didn't call that, that name. And Richard Bellman, you might heard that name if you took machine learning. Optimality criteria, Bellman criterion. Have you heard about that one? Dynamic programming. So he developed the theory of dynamic programming. This is his work. 
dynamic programming. And he has obviously optimality criteria on his name, which is, uh, I believe, Belmont Pontragen theorem, which is allowing you to program systems to be optimal and to control systems in optimal ways. So he was one of the fathers of optimal control. And uh, those two people on the top wrote one of the first textbooks on optimal and modern control. It was 72, I believe, before we all were born. And I had privilege to learn from one of them. So Rafael Sivan was my teacher of controls. So from him, I started my work on control system. He was teacher, technical. So why all of that modern control basically came to the view? So classical control very, was very popular. In 40s and 50s, it was super popular. And it worked. Okay, we were able to control this Nyquist and this Bode. We were able to control multiple different systems. Okay, people controlled all kinds of things. Machinery, you know, or all kinds of more complicated things. But what happened is that, if you remember, there was Cold War between Russia and the United States from 40s, probably. Now, the war was not an actual warm war, regular war, but who will be faster, better, you know, in all kinds of things. And one of those things was space, was space. So space was important for people. People wanted to go to space at the time. And Russians were ahead of time, and in 57, I believe, they launched the first satellite, which was called Sputnik. And in the United States, we were not ready to launch anything yet. Now, by the way, do you know what Sputnik means? Very inventive name. It means satellite. So they launched the first Sputnik, and then Americans also wanted to have it. Right, we need to be the first ones, right? We cannot give them opportunity to, to be first ones. And now in 60, they, there was a Congress of Automatic Control in Moscow, and all of the American scientists were allowed to go there. And there, it was closed country, right? You cannot get any publications from Russia, you cannot get any information from there. It's completely closed country, right? But this was the first time where they were allowed to go there and to listen to those lectures from Russians. And it appears that Russians actually working on completely different type of controls. They returned back to differential equations. They returned back to linear algebra. They returned back to basic math. And using, instead of asymptotic stability, they're using Lapunov stability. All of the Russian names, right? All of that was developed there completely separate, a completely separate line of thought. Completely different thing. Sounds like unrelated to controls uh, that was in the West. And then in a few years, they developed the same program, which was doing that kind of modern control. And this was very hot topic in the 60s. And you know that in the 60s, first person in space, and all of those uh, space shuttles later, Apollo program, and so on and so on. Everything was built on that control. Why? Because in classical control, if you want to build system with more than one input and more outputs, it's super hard, super difficult. In modern control, piece of cake, the same thing. I mean, nothing is changing when you're doing that with multiple inputs, multiple outputs, exactly the same way. The same thing for digital controls, the same thing for analog controls. I mean, tiny changes, very cosmetic changes, the same thing. And this is why this control theory came to be very popular later. Now, I have very brief explanation of what we want to get from this. So in the control system design, in the previous course that you took on controls, you probably heard that you have something which is called plant, and plant, this is a system that you want to control, right? And then you want to design such a controller, which is also system, that you put that in series, or maybe you put that in feedback, but at the end of the day, you want that the output of the system will be as similar as possible 
choose the reference signal that you put in here. So you have output coming out of here, right? And the input reference coming from here. So you want that output reference to be controlled in such a way that it will be almost equal to reference. This is a goal of any control system that we know about. Now, also you want the system to be stable, obviously. You want the system to have reduced response to disturbance, and disturbance is coming, it could come from here, or some external input from here. Sometimes some noise can come from here. Add it here. It could come at different places, but we want the system to ignore it. Now, obviously this is a difficult question, how to ignore it, right? The system is getting the signal, right, in the loop somewhere. Now, how we avoid it? So the idea is that the transfer function between D and Y should be as close to zero as possible. Okay, so the gain for most of the frequencies of interest in the range that we want, and how do we know which range we want? Based on the system. So for example, if you have a robotic arm, obviously you don't care about frequencies in the megahertz range, right? Because this arm will not move that fast. You don't care about kilohertz range even. You, you care about maybe 20 hertz, okay? This is all you care about. What will happen after 12, uh, 20 hertz, who cares? Okay, you can put as, many, as much noise as you want after that. So in that band, which is from 20 to infinity, you want the transfer function to be almost zero from D to Y. But transfer, from, transfer function from R to Y to be as close to one as possible, at least in that band from zero to 20. Okay, then your system is robust in that sense. So it basically rejects all of the disturbances. Now, additional things that we would like to have is minimal control effort. Now, I don't know if you learned that kind of term, what is control effort, but control effort is U of T, is input of the plant. Obviously, you want to use minimal energy you could use from your power supply. You don't want to use medium volts. You want some small signal which you will control, it, okay? So this is the overall idea of what you want. Now, I have tricky question for you. So we said that we want Y of T to track closely R of T. So we want them to be identically equal. This is perfect, right, if they are identically equal. Now, I propose the following system. You have system which is controller C of S, and it equals zero, just multiplies by zero, everything comes in. It's connected to something, to disturbance, to plant as usual, but instead of doing feedback from Y, I disconnect Y and connect it to the feedback loop to R. Like making wire. Obviously, what you will measure on Y, this is R of T, right? By definition. So, is that ideal system? Okay. Design ideal system, Y equals to R. Isn't that what you want? No, so what, but y equals to r. You, uh, do, you, do you want to know what it was before? Yes. Right, so the idea here, this is the difference between mass and physics. Yeah, mathematically you want R to be equal to Y, or actually Y equal to, to R. But practically this makes no sense at all. Why? Because what is planned? For example, this is motor. You want that motor to rotate such and such number of rotations per second. This is what you control it for. And you're saying how many rotations per second you want by giving some specific level of voltage as your reference, right? So you want to give that reference, higher the reference is, more rotations you get. But from that system, you get no rotations at all, no matter what input is. Get no input. And then plant is not rotating. Output equals to input. But plant is not rotating, not producing any output, essentially. So, practically speaking, we don't want system which produces the same output as input. We want 
system which is controlled to produce such response as you want, as we described in the in. This is the actual goal of control, not just to produce y equals to r. It's completely different, right? And this is example y. This is different. Okay, so we want to control the system, and all of the systems will be built from three, all of the plants will be built from three different parts. One part is actuator, which is, in most cases, some sort of driver, which is supplying, for example, enough power or supplying enough current or supplying something, converts the signal into actual voltage or current or power. Okay? The main plant, which is the piece that you want to control, and this could be not only motor, it could be basically anything. It could be any controllable system. And then sensor. Now, to know what output is, you have to use some sort of sensor. You have to measure it. Now, this sensor could be physical, which is actual physical thing, which is sitting on the device and measuring voltage, measuring number of rotations, measuring light, measuring temperature, measuring whatever. Or it could be computer, computed from other data. Okay, it could be virtual sensor if you like. But you always have something like actuator, which controls the device, with input of the device, and output, which is sensor of the device. Device or process, it could be also process, not only device. Now, more sensor you have, easier to control the system. And especially for state space, you want always to measure more and more things to get better and better control, more precise control, more variables to measure. So you want, ideally, you want to have a number of sensors which is of order of the system. So if your system, for example, is third order, you want three points of measurement, three different things to be measured, for example. This is ideal if you can do that. Not always it is possible. For example, you have an uh, airplane and let's say you have a model of its engine, right? So part of the parameters is how much air coming in through the engine of the jet. How can you measure that? You can't really. You can estimate it. You can guess it. You can compute it from other things that you can measure, okay? And for that, you need estimator. So estimator will basically measure things that you cannot measure directly from the device. This is how it will work. Now, you have a very important part here, how to model system. And you have multiple ways to model different systems. For example, step response. If your system is stable, you just input in some step response, step input, and then obviously get some sort of output. It could be with overshoot, without overshoot. Depends. Depends on the system, obviously. So have some sort of output response. Based on relation between output and input, you can compute at least second order model for the system. How would you do that? So again, yeah, you have multiple ways. You can do optimization, you can do that in MATLAB, you can do second order approximation. Simplest one is just to measure settling time, overshoot, and based on settling time and overshoot, you have two equations. One equation for settling time and one equation for overshoot. Based on those equations, it gives you a relation between those things and location of the poles of the system. Okay, two poles. If you have those two equations, you can find location of those two poles by just algebra and then you will have transfer function of the system. Not precise, but close enough. Now, bullet diagram estimation. So this is why you learn in control systems and also in signals and systems, you learn bullet diagrams. Not because we want you to plot by hand bullet diagrams, not the idea. Bullet diagrams allow you to identify the system. So you have a black box and you're sending, and let's assume that this is stable black box. So you're sending some inputs, you're getting some outputs. You get some very, very, very low frequency sine wave of amplitude one to the input of the system and measuring the output. What should be the output for linear systems at least, linear time invariant, invariant? What will be the output? You put in sine of very low frequency amplitude one. What will be the output? Another sine wave. Another sine wave. Shifted 
and different amplitude, right? So now putting higher frequencies sign this amplitude one. Again, you get different shift, different amplitude. Again, higher frequency, different shift, different amplitude. So you can plot both the diagram from that experiment, essentially. And you get point by point phase and amplitude, which is magnitude. Why? Because if this amplitude is input amplitude is one, the amplitude of output is B. So B divided by one is basically gain, right? This is magnitude, this absolute value of that. Now, this is upper part of body diagram and lower part is shift of the phase. This is what body diagram is, right? Now you have body diagram, you can approximate it by asymptotic body diagram, which means you're just doing straight segment connection of the dots. You approximate it by straight segments. Now, what are the breaking points in the magnitude of body diagram? Location of poles or zeros, right? It depends if it goes up or down. On phase, you can say if it is pole or zero of the system, right? So this works fine if your poles and zeros are sparse, like you don't have many at the same point or close. If it is kind of distributed, then it works fine for any stable system. And you can identify the system just based on the body diagram. This is one of the possible ways to get your model from just experiment. Now, main thing for linear modeling is just from physical principles. So this is most popular thing where you know physics behind some mechanism. It could be circuits, it could be mechanical, it could be chemical, it could be whatever. But you know some physics and mechanics behind that. You blend in all that knowledge of differential equations together and modeling starting from initial principles from physics. This is the most popular method for design or modeling of systems. Any questions? So in that lecture, as you paid attention probably, I'm trying to summarize all of the points of classical control yet, just to give you a brief overview of what you're supposed to know on controls in general. Now, another question for you. Nonlinear systems, first of all, step response and body diagram are dependent on input shape. So for nonlinear systems, you cannot plot body diagram, single body diagram. You cannot have transfer functions. You cannot use superposition for anything. So, and you want to handle it somehow. So the question is, if transfer functions have no use or not practical for nonlinear systems, and you also know that uh, all systems have uncertainty in parameters, right? So all the models are not precise. They have kind of variability. And most systems, if not all, are nonlinear. Why we learn about linear systems? Two courses. What do you think? Yes and yes, nothing else. So this is the main reason to learn linear system. So this is true that no linear systems exist in real life. And practically all systems are non-linear. And those tools are not working on non-linear systems at all. None of them. Okay? But most systems also could be approximated, piecewise approximated, with linear system. And for those systems, it's much, much, much easier to design controllers and to design anything you want to design compared to nonlinear systems. And still, you have controllers designed directly for nonlinear systems, like sliding mode control and other things of that kind. But this is much, much, much simpler. Even what I'm saying that, that algebra is complicated and you will see some complicated formulas, this is trivial compared to nonlinear control, okay? And stuff that you need to learn to understand how to control nonlinear systems. And not every nonlinear system you need to control. More than that, almost any control of any new nonlinear system is kind of doctorate work, like PhD. To control a single system, which is nonlinear, PhD work. You need to invest like three years to control it. And research, you know, 
design controller for that system. This is how it works. This is how the thing is difficult. Now let's see some simple example. I don't know if you've seen a similar example in control systems course. Just motor, simple motor with disk on the motor and some torque on the disk applied uh, from some uh, given input. And in that given input, you have first of all torque equation. You obviously don't need to remember all the physics behind that. I'm just summarizing the actual physics, uh, what we need to know. You have rotational Newton's law, second law of motion. Uh, so first one says that torque is proportional to current. More current you supply to your motor, stronger torque you will get. Second one says that theta, two dots, which is second derivative in time. Uh, basically this is angular acceleration. Theta is angle of the disk. Okay, starting from some initial angle zero. So second derivative of the theta is basically angular acceleration. And then uh, you have J, which is constant, multiplied by that angular acceleration equals to torque. This is like F equals MA. Um, now, back EMF, electromagnetic force that you have, which is on motor between minus and plus, is proportional to the angular velocity of the motor. And now you have also Kirchhoff voltage laws that you're supposed to know, which says that summary, if you're summarizing all of the voltages in the loop, they should be zero, basically. So this is Kirchhoff voltage law. Basically, we know that voltage on the inductor is L dI to dt, then voltage on the R is R times I, and then you have back EMF voltage, and it equals to input voltage. Basically, if you move it to the left, it will be minus V of T. And then equals to zero. This is Kirchhoff law. So I move V to the opposite direction because V has opposite polarity, right? Input voltage always has opposite polarity from all of the voltages in the circuit. Basically, the plus is from the left on R and from the left on A. So they add up to zero. So those are four equations that we need to know for what we need. Now, from the first two equations, we just put T. Instead of T, in the second equation, we put Ki, right? So we take T from here and put the Ki here, and then we get that equation. Any questions so far? We're just simplifying and getting rid of some of the variables. We want to get rid of some of those variables. We want to get rid of E and of T. Which are kind of axillary variables, we don't want them. Now, from the second one, we're just putting, taking the E from here, moving it here, and then we get the equation here. This is differential equation. So we have two differential equations, one of the second order, because we have second derivative, and two dots it's second derivative with respect to time, and first order derivative equation. Okay, this is how it looks like. Now the question is how we get the transfer function from that kind of physical representation. How we convert from ordinary differential equation to transfer function. So this is just repetition of what you were supposed to learn from other courses like linear systems, controls, signal systems, and so on. Just to remind you, so for that we need to make Laplace transform of both sides of the equation. And to get Laplace transform, you need to remember that thing. This is Laplace transform of derivative. First derivative and Laplace transform of second derivative. Remember, you have also initial conditions there in the form of, you have that in the table, but you don't have to remember all those details. Now, our goal is to find such G of S, or we call it probably previously H of S, but it doesn't matter, which is output of S, which is theta, angle, we want to control angle, right? Divided by input, which is V of S, in Laplace domain. So let's get to actual computation here. So if I'm making Laplace transform of the first equation, I'm putting, first of all, J from here, times second derivative of that thing, it's like this one. So it should be 
here I'm taking this one. This one is like here. It's S squared times the variable of S minus S times the variable at zero minus theta dot at zero. Right, this is how it goes. Now, second one is coming from here. So it's L times derivative, and derivative is just S times F. S times the variable that we have here is I minus initial condition on I at zero. Initial condition on zero. Plus R times I, so transform of I is still I. Plus K theta dot K, exactly the same thing, just instead of theta. Instead of i, you can write it. The theta of s and theta of z. And transform of the last one is the other. Okay, so far, you just look last transform both sides of both of those equations. That's it. Now, out of those of that system of two equations, we want to find g of s, which is theta of s. So we want to isolate that thing, right? And that thing. And to make that thing divided by d of s, which is that thing. We want to get rid of everything else. So what is everything else that we want to get rid of? First of all, we want to get rid of i of s. Right? Because this is not there. We don't want it to be a function of i of s. We can leave all of the constants. Right? No problem at all. We can leave all of the s times whatever. Because s is part of the transfer function. S will be here. Those might be a function of S. We can leave A, J, R, K. All of those could be left. Why? Because those are constants. Those are just numbers. They can appear anywhere you want. Now, when we combine those terms together, so we basically combine this one, this, this one, this is what we get. Some algebra. Okay. So look. On that thing, we want to write that thing as theta divided by b equals to something. So we want to isolate basically this one and this one. Is that possible? This is transfer function, right? This is what it is. So look. Those are constants, right? Those are constant. This is constant. This is constant. This is constant. That zero is also constant. Those constant. This is constant. Those constants. Constant. Constant. This is. S is not constant, but that is zero is constant. That dot zero is constant. This is constant. I zero. Like all of that is constant. This is number, right? Given initial conditions. So it looks like that. I can write it in different way. So. Theta of S equals basically some function, let's call it alpha of S. Okay, this is alpha of S times B of S plus some sort of beta of S. Right? Like all of the right part in the plus is some function of S because everything else is constant. Left part is also something as a function of s times v, and equals to theta. And now you want g of s out of that thing. Can you do that? Why not? It's a problem, right? How do you solve the problem? This is what you want to compute, right? You want theta divided by v. This is a transfer function. But here you get alpha v plus beta equals theta. What should you do? For specific S? Exactly. I mean, theta zero could be any number. Theta dot zero could be any number. I zero could be any number. I mean, this is initial condition, or whatever it is. What should we do with that? Uh, 
that's not only for that specific system, this is the same thing happens for any system. And still you're working with transfer functions, right? People somehow find, find those transfer functions. That's exactly what the thing is. Transfer function is defined for initial conditions zero only. If your initial conditions are not zero, transfer function is not defined. So by definition, transfer function is when all of the right part is zero. Which means theta zero is zero, theta dot zero is zero, i zero is zero, everything is zero. So all of the right part is zero. Only then you can define transfer function. And then obviously you'll get the thing. Most people don't remember that. You never pay attention to that. The transfer function is essentially only zero state systems. Not complete response of the system. This is not everything. This is just zero state response. Assuming that state is zero, which is obviously not true for most systems. In most cases, right? You have some initial values, right? You start in your voltage and capacitor is not zero. Almost never. But transfer functions assuming this is all zero. Otherwise, you cannot define it. Even. And this is why. You cannot define it otherwise. So transfer functions are not exactly complete description of the system. It's just simplified description of the system for zero state response, not for any other state. You cannot handle any other state with that. Okay, so with regard to that, I want to ask you another problem, another question, design. So I propose new controller design system. Yeah, three. Tricky one. You have reference input. You have control system G of S, whatever it is, some transfer function. You have some output if you want to, to be as close as possible to R of T. Okay, response close to reference input. And my design is very simple. I'm just taking the thing, which is G of S, inverting it. It's called inverse dynamics. And this is my controller. That's it. So Essentially, transfer function is one of total system, right? From R to Y. Because it's one over G times G. G divided by G is one. So, the question is, what is wrong with the design? Perfect, right? Transfer function one. From input to output. But your transfer function doesn't Okay, this is one of the things. So you basically ignoring initial conditions, which means that initial conditions of your controller will be different from initial conditions of the plant. But after transient response to initial conditions, it will converge. Really? Maybe it's correct answer. Depends. There's always correct answer. It depends. Depends on what. It's not even promised to be stable. Now the question is why? Transfer function is one. More stable than that. It not be, right? But what is wrong here? Obviously, if this would work, everybody would use that. No? This is simple. Why you need all of those feedbacks and locuses and other horrible stuff? Here, just make one over what our transfer function is, and you're done. If you don't care about transient systems. Eh, sometimes, it depends. But let's say you don't. 
let's say, transient response to the plasma. Disturbances? Hmm? Yeah, I'm not accounting for disturbances, yes. So let's say it's very unnoisy system, not too much noise. Yeah, it will, it will affect a little bit the output, the noise. It will affect the output, you're right. Anything else? Do you think it will always, always be stable? Asymptotically feeble or whatever? The answer is no, but why not? What you have learned in control systems course, obviously you learned that this should be stable. This is one. No zeros, no fours. But this is incorrect for any physical system. They all cancel. They all cancel. This is the problem. That you always have uncertainty in parameters. Let's say you had some system which is 1 over s minus 1, which is unstable, obviously. Now your controller is s minus 1, right? And s minus 1 cancels with s minus 1. So you had that thing. So this one, this one is s minus 1. Now what? Let's say this one is not exactly s minus 1, but s minus 1 point zero 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 one. Okay, the plan. Not exactly one, but there's some tolerance. What will happen to the system? It will not cancel precisely, and you will have unstable fall. It will diverge. Right? So you cannot cancel unstable poles of easily. Stable poles are kind of not, not great, but you can. But unstable poles you cannot cancel at all. If you cancel unstable poles, you get troubles. Your system still will be unstable because parameters are uncertain. And all of what you said before also true. You have response to disturbances, which is basically you're not cleaning those responses, noises. You're not responding to initial conditions and you have some transient responses. But even more importantly is to say that the system is not proper for a controller. Let's say you have the same thing. Let's say you have one divided by S minus one, plus one, whatever. Your controller will be S plus one or minus one. Can you realize it when you actually build it? The system is not causal, which means you need to know the future to get present output. You cannot build it. It's not physical. You cannot do it. I mean, the only way that this thing could work only if the system GS is proper, but not strictly proper, which means the number of zeros exactly equal to number of poles. And then when you're inverting it, you still have the same number of zeros in here. Right, and then you can realize it. But if number of zeros is smaller than number of poles, you cannot build in both system. Not possible, typically. Because the system is not causal. Thing. You have something like derivative, which means the future to compute the present. So this will never work. Do you want short break now? Okay.
So, um, quick question on that last slide, please. Um, mm -hmm. If your view is, is the, from the transfer function, is the only criteria for causality that there are more forms than yours? More or the same? More or the same. This is proper system. You have strictly proper where you have more poles than zeros, or proper which is more or equal. Simple condition. And then you can say that system is, you can basically build the system physically. Um, proper, strictly proper, strictly proper is when they are not good enough. Continue. So we discussed how we get from OD to transfer function, right? From transfer function to OD, it's even easier. You're just taking the transfer function as is, writing it as equal to y divided by v, or whatever the input is, or u, and then cross multiplying those terms and making inverse Laplace transform. So you're making inverse Laplace transform on d multiplied by y, where n is basically some polynomial of S and D is some polynomial of S, actual transfer function, right? So you're just multiplying Y by D and then doing inverse Laplace transform of that polynomial and inverse Laplace transform of N times V. So one example of that. So we had those equations before, right? We found transfer function like the promoter of third order, right? And you have theta divided by V equals K divided by the polynomial of third order. Now, you're taking inverse Laplace transform of Z1, that multiplication, and inverse Laplace transform of that multiplication, which is basically written here. Now, you're thinking about S as operator, when you're thinking about Laplace, right? So times S is basically derivative, times S squared is second derivative, times S cubed is third derivative, and so on. So thinking about that as J times L, times third derivative of theta. So thinking about that as operator, operating on the variable for plus. Plus rj, second derivative of theta. Plus k squared, third derivative of theta. Equals k of t. And this is what we get, which is differential equation. Now, another question. Is it equivalent there's also original ones, because we started with two differential equations, if you remember, right? For the motor, and those are the equations. And now we convert it back from transfer function and get single equation. Is that the same? No, both of them have initial condition. Because those are differential equations. Obviously, you have theta zero, theta dot zero, so I zero, and in that case, you have that the two dots zero. Are those two equivalent? Because we start with the bottom two, got from those bottom two, two transfer functions, which is this one, and then from transfer function, we got that to the third order. So is a third order equivalent to those of first and second order? You, you can plug in. You can divide by k both sides, right? 
is I get j divided by k, second derivative, then I take the derivative from both sides. You get j divided by k, theta three dots equals i dot. Then you put into i dot and i from here. Right? You get third order equation. You can't get that. Will that be the same? Equivalent and representing the same system, including the same information about the original system, original model. This is the same. No, not in that case. I mean, the equation works exactly the same. But what do you mean exactly the same? Is this one equation is also two? How, how exactly the same? Have one equation of the third order, which is this one. Is that equivalent to those two? System of two equations. Are you losing the information? Why? You are not losing any ability to find any form. You have input and you have output. Your input is voltage, your output is theta. And this is what you described. It doesn't matter how you computed that, and it doesn't matter what sits inside of the box. In terms of description of the system, is there any difference? Yes. This is not a tricky question, actually. Now, who thinks yes? Okay. So, those are completely equivalent. You can get from one another and to convert all the initial conditions and to get exactly the same. So those representations of the same system are exactly the same. Now I'm returning to my previous question. So if I've got from transfer function, those, this is third order differential equation. Right? I've got from transfer function, I've got the differential equation. Now, is the transfer function equivalent to the whole thing? Answer is no. Okay. Question is why? Because in transfer function you have zero initial conditions, and in those different equations you have all kinds of initial conditions. So you cannot say that they are representing the same system. Transfer functions represent systems with zero initial conditions. Nothing else. And those differential equations represent systems with any initial condition. And this is why those representations are not equivalent. But previous ones are equivalent because they all had initial condition. This is the answer. Okay, a few words about stability. Uh, just a reminder, because we will use it all the time, a lot of it. You have two types of stability that you learned so far. Vivo stability stability and asymptotic stability. So for Bebo stability, you need the all of the poles, at least for continuous time system, will be in the left center plane. For discrete time, you need all of the poles to be in unit circle. 
And you need to remember the difference between discrete time and continuous time. It will continue to move and control the same thing. So all of the poles has to be to the left for stability in continuous time and has to be in unit circle for stability in discrete time. Okay? Is that clear? So those are basic things, basic theory. Now, for asymptotic stability, this theorem works before cancellation of any poles and zeros. For Debo stability, after cancellation. This is the only difference. So if system has some cancellation, you might have Debo stable, but not asymptotically stable. But if it is asymptotically stable, it's definitely Debo stable. Because if before the cancellation, everything was stable, obviously after cancellation, it's still stable. Right? You cannot get it unstable from cancellation. Right? Because if you have some poles and all of them are stable, and then you cancel in some of them, the rest of them is still stable. So asymptotic stability is much stronger than deeper stability. Asymptotic stability means that it is stable both asymptotically and deeper, but not the other way around. Deeper is weaker stability, weaker kind of stability. So in that example, for example, that we have here, you have cancellation of S minus two, right, fall at two, which is unstable for Now, frankly, calling poles unstable is incorrect mathematically. So this is why I'm using stable roots in quotes, because roots cannot be stable or unstable. System can be, but roots are just located here or there. Those are the roots that are causing the system to become unstable. So I call them unstable poles. Okay, this is what I mean by that. Now, if I'm canceling S minus two, obviously the rest of the system, which is five times S plus one divided by S plus two, S plus seven, the system is stable, right? The poles are at minus two and minus seven. So it's people stable. But since original system, was this unstable pole, the system is not asymptotically stable in that case. Questions? This is just an example of Debo stable and asymptotically unstable system. What is the, uh, the difference between the What? Why is the location of poles has anything to do with stability? Yes, you can. It's asymptotically all of the all of the responses go to zero. I mean, generally, you have one response if you have system system. So this response goes asymptotically to zero when t goes to infinity from initial conditions which are not zero. So asymptotic is defined for input zero, right? You put in input, your reference is zero all the time. Your initial conditions are not zero. So starting with some initial angles, locations, whatever it is, okay, some variables. It starts to do something, okay, from those initial conditions, oscillates or going exponentially down or doing whatever it is. But eventually it goes to zero asymptotically. So eventually it gets to zero. It has to, if it is asymptotically stable. Or not if it is not asymptotically stable. It could continue oscillating forever. It could go to infinity plus, infinity minus, could be all kind, all kind of things. But if it is asymptotically stable, it goes asymptotically to zero. Yeah. Since the input is zero, right? So the input has if the input is zero, the output has to be zero. Again? Most probably this thing is, will be unstable to initial conditions. So you will put some initial conditions to your system, it will diverge. Okay, but if you put in limited inputs, it will not diverge with zero initial conditions, right? So if you put in zero initial conditions, if all of your initial conditions are zero, but input is not zero, but bounded, which means you have like highest value and lowest value, it 
runs between those values, okay? The output also will run between those values, between some other values, not those values, some other values. But it will not go to infinity. It will not diverge. It might not converge to zero, but it will be bound. It will not go to infinity. This is all it means. Okay? Now, the question is, what is so special about the left semiplane? Why it has to be stable when it is in the left semiplane, it is for continuous time system? What is so special about that semiplane? What do you think? It means that real part of the roots of poles is negative. So basically, this is what it means. You have real of all SI smaller than real. This is the condition for stability. So, what is so special about the real part of S? Mm -hmm. It's no, all of that is exponential. I mean, but S is complex, right? Could be. It could be real or it could be complex. It could have complex poles or real poles. But all of them should sit in the left, which means that you have that kind of system. You have system of coordinates, which is real imaginary, and then all of the poles should sit here. On the left part. So, why? What is so special about left part? Mm -hmm. Why is it gain function stable? The gain function? Why is it the gain function? What, what, what fu one function of what? What function? Where do you get the function of time? Inverse Laplace of the poles. Why do you inverse Laplace of the poles? Exponential became function when? It's not only when an exponential function goes like that, it's going, down, going up, right? Why is that? Because the rate of the x-axis is So what happens with imaginary part? And what happens with imaginary part? The imaginary part is the assignment What is the absolute value or magnitude of that? The imaginary part? No. So look, you have differential equation of some kind. Let's say you have y three dots plus y y two dots. Think about zero for asymptotic stability. Okay? Now, you have solution of that kind of linear equation. What would be the general solution of that kind of equation? So y of t, so all of them are function of t. I'm not going even to a plus domain. So what is y of t? K okay, in a circle, let's call it C1 times what? What is that something? How do you solve that kind of equations? Any equations of that kind. So this differential equation obviously describes some system, right? And you have some constant coefficient. This is called linear differential equation of third order. How to solve linear differential equation of third order? What is general solution of that kind of thing? Mm 
by the yes. Related to exponent, yes. So far, it's correct. It's some constant times exponent to the power of what? Not negative. Which one? What else? What else? That's not true. About one. So now what is S1 is the three? Those are not the plus variables. And I can call them lambda if you like. Just generally people prefer S for some reason. But this is not that is in kind of relates. But what is S1 is to actually how you compute them? This is how we compute it. It's the roots of the cubic equation. Now, obviously, this cubic equation, I'm just replacing every dot this power of S. This is exactly what last transform. Right? This is what it is. And then you're solving that algebraic equation and finding the roots of that algebraic equation, which are what of the system? How they relate to the system? Those are poles of the system. Exactly. So S1, S2, S3 are poles of the system, okay, which are also roots of that cubic equation, which is what last transform of the original differential equation. Right? This is a connection. So all of them are connected. Now, what those poles are, you can write every one of them like SI. You can write as basically AI plus IQ, right? Some complex number, each one of them, right? So you will get some of exponents times some constant of that kind. E A plus B J times T, right? Which is E A T E B T J, something like that. Now, you have some of that kind of things together, right? Some, something of that kind. And you have coefficient C1 times that thing, plus coefficient C2 times that thing. Now, you are talking about divergence. What, mean, what it means divergence? Divergence means that absolute value of the entire Y of T will be going to infinity. So the overall magnitude will go to infinity. So if you take absolute value here, on that thing, right? It will go up or it will go basically down, depends on the sign of the actual expression inside. Correct? Right? Now, if you remember the inequality of triangle, remember triangle inequality? What it says is that the absolute value of sum is smaller than or equal the absolute values of the, each one of those terms, right? Now, this means that even if one of them will go to infinity, right, the entire thing will go to infinity. Because everything else, even if they decay to zero, right, so what? If one goes to infinity, it will diverge. If more than one goes to infinity, it still will diverge, right? So this is the overall idea. So you're thinking about single term. Now, what is that single term, absolute value of that single term, which is basically that thing? Absolute value of multiplication is multiplication of absolute values, right? So you get E to the AT absolute value times E to the D, E, G absolute value. So what is the second one? No, absolute value of it. E of the chain theta, whatever, no matter what. 
What is absolute value of E to the G theta? Absolute value, it's magnitude. It's circle, unit circle, right? It's running on unit circle, so what is magnitude? One, it's constant, one. Because this is the black is I've seen, it's one, right? So you get the magnitude of all of those terms, it will be basically C1 multiplied by absolute value of E of A T. Now, if A, it's basically real value, right? The real part of the complex value S. If A is negative, what will happen when T goes to infinity? The exponent will go to zero. If A is positive, what will happen? We'll go to infinity or minus infinity. Depends on the sign of C, right? So the conditions of all of them will go to zero is that all of those A parts will be negative. And A is exactly a real part of S, right? This is the condition. This is how it works. All of them should go to zero. All of them should converge. And then everything converges. Otherwise, it will diverge. If at least one of them will be on the positive side. That's it. Okay. Any questions? Here is just a simple example. You'll find that I think in the, in the lectures too that you have specific equations. So this works on, not only for input zero, but it works also for any other inputs that you have convergence when you have C times E to the power of whatever. Now, what can I say about the last condition where what will happen if all roots satisfy, for example, real part smaller than minus two, minus five, minus 10, whatever. Some not zero, but farther to the left. What will happen to the system? Obviously, they will be stable, but anything else? Now, based on the understanding of what we just discussed, that each one of them contributes that exponent which is going down, and if all of them are going down, they all converge, and then the sum also converges. And everything is beautiful, everything is stable. Now, I'm saying it's not only converging, but it's also all of them pushed to the left. And now what? So this real part is smaller than minus two, minus whatever. What else you can say on that, on that system? What will happen? Lower? It's e to the minus two t or minus five t or minus 20 t it will converge faster, what it means with regard to the system. It's more responsive, it's faster, generally faster. So the response is faster. Now, if it is, if you want to design a controller which will move it to minus one medium, what could happen to the system? Oh, sure. It depends on the system. I mean, this could be a first of the system. Then you don't have overshoot no matter what. But what is so bad on designing very, very, very far away from that instability boundary at J omega? Because this is stability question, right? You have J omega, if your poles are close to J omega, they kind of close to instability, or oscillation or divergence. But if you put them very, very, very far away, what's wrong with that? Why don't you want to put them there? What kind of disturbance? Why? So what are you increasing this putting all the poles 
part of the land. Yes, to some extent, yes, but where it comes from. So the problem is that you basically increase in bandwidth. So this bandwidth means that you are not filtering all of those high frequencies. And noise is known to have full spectrum of frequencies, right? So wider your bandwidth is, more noise you're entering into the system. You have wider broadband, more noise coming in. This is how it works, right? You're not filtering that noise anymore. So you don't want to put them too far away to the left, but you don't want them to be too close to the GM because it's kind of close to unstable and system parameters are not very reliable. Okay, so this is what you know about location of poles and we will be talking in modern control all the time about putting poles in specific location. This will be our design. We will take some location of the poles and open loop and trying to move them somewhere else where we want them to be. Okay. Now, the question is where we want them to be. This is a tricky question, not always easy to answer where we want our poles to be. Now, one simple answer is to use dominant pole theory, which is, again, assuming that your system is second order, and most of the systems are not second order. But this is just for simplicity. Saying something like that. The idea is that you know how fast your system should work, but you don't want it to be too fast, okay? So on the one hand, you want all of the poles to be farther to the left, and farther to the left, faster the system is, right? Based on the settling time that you envision to be minimal settling time, maximum settling time you want, right? So you know that you want your system to converge in, for example, two seconds, right? So this will define your right boundary of the trapezoid. It will say where your poles should be to the left to the right side of the trapezoid, right? Based on the setting time. Now, overshoot is defined by the angle P here. Okay, so angle P defines how much overshoot you have. If the angle is zero, you don't have any overshoot. So if all poles sitting on that axis, no overshoot at all. Poles on real axis, no producing any overshoot. You get overshoot only from complex poles. So this is basically maximal angle for overshoot you could handle. And you get it from the pole mode. Right, so this is basically defining the concept of the so overshoot you get eta, and from eta you get the angle. You know how wide the thing should go. Now pay attention that for all of your systems, poles are always coming in pairs where they are complex. Which means if you have one pole here, you have to have pole here. Which is conjugate on the pole. So all real polynomials have conjugate poles for sure. So if you have one here, you have one here, you have one here, you obviously will have one, one here. For any real polynomials, it's always true. Okay? Now, so this is how you define Z side. Now, how you define Z side is depends on the benefits you want, which means how much noise you can tolerate, okay? what frequencies you noise will have. So it depends again on the system. And you'll say, I don't want it too far away because this will give me, give me more noise. Generally, you want it to be as close as possible to that side, not to that side. But some poles can go here too. That's fine. Now, this is a very simplistic thing, but it gives you approximately idea where you want your poles to be based on your design overshoot and so on. From now on, we will always assume that we know where to put the poles. So somebody gave us the location of poles. But you need to know that this is very difficult, actually, problem, where to put the poles. So again, I told you that network will give you in one comment will give you uh, location of the poles whenever, wherever you want them. But where you want them is a difficult problem. So we're basically converting one problem of magic in classical control where you're just designing the system, iterating and trying different things and using border diagrams and so on, into mechanical solution, which is just one line of MATLAB. But to that comment, you need to give location of the poles. You need to give location of the closed loop poles, like where you want them to be. And how do you know? Based on that, maybe it's kind of tricky. 
this is a sim simplistic representation of what you have and what you want. But sometimes you have other constraints and other things that you would like to have. For example, this is not considering at all what will be your input UC, like what will be your control effort, how much energy you will spend. But no mention of that here, right? Maybe to get that kind of overshoot and that kind of uh, settling time, you need super strong voltage. Who knows, right? This problem will be solved by optimal controls, which will handle the case. Okay, this is the overall idea. But we will start with that simplistic thing. And one of the final questions of controller design. Now, we want closed loop controller function to have some specific poles. Let's say we decided on the poles based on whatever theory we want. We know where we want them. And we know that closed loop transfer function, if you learn that from control system, equals to that thing. The serial controller C and when G. Remember the formula? So it's like C times G divided by one plus C. This is closed loop transfer function. Given controller C, if you want to find, you don't have it here, and when G. I propose algebraic solution. Look. Geo closed loop, you know, this is some transfer function that you decided. But I want zeros here and I want poles there. Okay, decided on that. You have polynomial divided by polynomial equals to that thing. And you call those ratio of polynomials G closed loop. Now, from that one, G is known also. It's G of open loop. Right, this is plan. From that expression, we can find C. By algebra, you just multiply in Z thing by Z thing. And it equals that thing, then we're doing some algebra moving sides and finding basically C of S. That's what we do. C of S equals the G of closed loop divided by G of S times one minus G of closed loop. So G of closed loop is what you want. This is what you have an open loop. Found the control. What's wrong with that? Why we are not doing that? Why we need all those border, Nyquist, other headache? What's wrong with that one? Do you understand what I'm doing here? This is just simple algebra, right? Nothing complicated. I mean, there is no, hopefully, no mistake in the computations of it. Obviously, if you have some expression, you can re-express it in terms of other variables, any variable uh, in terms of other variables. So why nobody is doing that? Your closed loop like pick one divided by s plus one. Great, stable, asymptotically beable, whatever you want. If you want it faster, one divided by s plus ten. Also, no overshoot, no nothing. Good, great. Exponential growth like that, beautiful. For any geo fast, just put it in, get you. Your control. This is a question which is also avoided very carefully in the course on control systems. Why not that same? Why you need put locals, border, you know, all those difficult techniques and iterations? No iterations. Put in the formula gets the answer. How you want to evaluate it? For what? No. You're designing controller, you're not evaluating open loops. I mean, 
can analyze open transfer function, you analyze stability, you can analyze responses of the plant or whatever. But for the sake of design itself, you're just plotting, for example, with locus and finding the coefficient where it will fit in the location of the pulse you want. Or you will try to add lead lag, for example, and hoping that this lead lag will change the phase in such a way that it will still be stable and also satisfy some other conditions, like the phase and gain margin. But those phase and gain margins also, like, how do you get them? I mean, in the test, obviously, somebody gives you, right, those numbers uh, when you need to submit your assignment. But in real life, how do you know what gain margin you want? Or phase margin, whatever. Yeah, kind of. This is how it works in real life. But here you get formula, right? It's, Matlab can do it easily. Give me G of S, give me G close loop that you want, I will give you a controller. That's only that. No, not really. I mean, you can play with the number of holes and zeros in the G close loop, whatever you want. You can always get to the actual number of holes and zeros that you want. The, the answer here is paradoxical. <laughs> It's always before the plan. I mean, this specific one is when controller is uh, serial to the plan. But you can do the same formula. And the formula will look a little bit different when the, the controller into the feedback. But you still can compute formula if you work for that case. Right? And you will have instead of CG divided by 1 plus CG, you will have just G divided by 1 plus CG. You will not have the top. C1 in the closed loop formula, right? But you still can algebraically get back your C from everything else. Okay. The paradoxical answer here is that. But yeah, but plant is some transfer function, right? Yeah. Of course. Of course. And on desired, on desired closed loop transfer function, yeah. It depends on the transfer function of the plan and on the desired transfer function of loop. Possibly. Here. Why well, can't? I mean, G closed loop is just, you're just pulling it out of your head, right? Your closed loop is just pulling out of your head, whatever you want, right? Whatever you want. Give me your best transfer function you hope to get, right? And I'm giving you G of S. You cannot control it because this is planned. Put it in that formula and you get controllers that you want, that you need, right? Supposedly, yeah. So the answer is basically nothing wrong with the design. But there is a problem with design. That's why I'm saying this is paradoxical answer. If you're picking your closed loop transfer function in correct and smart way, you get control you want, actually. The problem is how you pick such closed loop transfer function, where you will not have cancellation of, for example, unstable poles in the system, 
and where you will not get all kind of other bad things that might happen to the system? This is the question. And it's not obvious from the formula, not obvious at all. I mean, you, by chance, you can pick good function to, to stabilize your system and to get good control, but it will be by chance. This is not that you can really base it, basic design on that. Okay, but nothing wrong with that, because all of the plant controllers will look like that. All of them. Like when you're doing that with root locus, when you're doing that with body, and so on and so on, you will get that for specific your course. Now, what, which ones will work? This is a question. And not all will work. This is a problem. Now, this is one example. Let's say your transfer function is 1 over s plus 2. And you want it to be in 1 divided by s plus 1, which is stable, beautiful transfer function, right? This is where you want it to be. So what will be your controller in that case, based on that formula? Your controller will be s minus 2 divided by s. And this system is proper. So realize it. You can actually build it. Right? It's 1 minus 2 divided by s. So it's constant gain minus integrator gain. This is the controller, right? So what's wrong with the controller? Mathematically, nothing. Works perfectly fine. Put the controller like g times, like that g, 1 divided by s minus 2, times c of s minus 2 divided by s, divided by 1 divided plus uh, g l, c, you will get 1 divided by s plus 1, which is perfect. But something's wrong here. What is wrong? We discussed it today already. You have uncertainty here. It's not exactly 2. It's 2.00001, for example, or whatever. It's not canceling with that S minus 2. It's not precise. And then the system is unstable in close loop, which is not nice. Okay? So you don't want anything like that. Again, if you would choose some other transfer function, like one divided by something else, maybe, then you would not get that answer. But how should you know? You can't know that from the actual expression here. Right? You're just guessing, you saying, like, I want them here or I want them there. If you're, wrong, if you're picking wrong side, you get bad results. Okay? Any questions? So next time we will stop with state space and move on from there. Um, you can, I, I don't have any slides basically for that course. I'm not sure that I want any slides in that course. Everything is written and I prefer that you will just bring printed pages of the actual uh, lecture. Okay, and then we will discuss the lecture. This was just introduction. We will continue introduction on state space. A little bit more, maybe a few more slides. And then we will move to actual lectures on modern control. I just propose that you print those pages. It will be easier for you to follow. Okay, and bring just pages to solve exercises in example. Any questions? Um, what about the, uh, the video? Yes, so uh, yeah, those were videos for linear algebra, and I designed this for a completely different course, which was basically much longer and then spread it to different topics related to all kinds of engineering stuff. So those topics are related to the course. Uh, those are basic algebra, like how you handle matrices, vectors, and so on. And then a little bit about eigenvectors, eigenvalues, uh, and things of that kind, just to remind you what it all means and how you work with it. Again, very brief. I will be returning to that and solving some examples. We will have tons of them in the course. Because this is like all the course about eigenvalues all the time. Because frankly, eigenvalues are nothing else but poles. So you will see the connection. The poles are essentially eigenvalues of specific matrices. And those matrices are state space matrices. And then all of the design will be based on those computing of determinants, eigenvalues, stuff like that. It's just thermal like. So for you, I think maybe before the next time, we will do also 
some background on linear algebra, uh, prepare something on linear algebra just to show you some examples, how you deal with uh, spaces and stuff like that, positive definite matrices, maybe other stuff that you haven't learned before. So we'll do some exercises with that next time. So bring appendix, which is all of those uh, mathematical formulas, this one, this one, okay. Unfortunately, I found a few mistakes in that one, but it works fine. Not a big deal. We'll correct it later. So this is linear algebra and other mathematical stuff that we'll be using in the quiz. Almost all of it is essential. Not all of it. We can skip some parts if you are not familiar with cholesterol decomposition and other stuff like that. You can skip it, but other stuff is important. Okay, we'll have a lot of it. And a lot of manipulation is made. Other questions? Okay, thank you.